name is Jen Wee. And uh, I, I founded T-Rex.ai about three years ago. And uh, we're in the business of uh, renewable energy certificates. You know, I, I like to start off with talking a little bit about the general environment, right? So I'm from Singapore. So uh, I like to talk a little bit about what the country has done, right? Uh, over the past decade, uh, in terms of uh, building sustainability into the heart of the people, right? And and it was it was really really touching the the hearts of every Singaporean about uh, a couple of months back when the when the Singapore government introduced the green plan, right? This is uh in my opinion a a, a fantastic plan. It is the first time in history that we are really putting some very aggressive targets for the country, right? Not only from Singapore mainland standpoint, we are the country is is trying to build a sustainable uh, know how and and concept within the people, not only within the country but in the region. So we, we have we have built this very uh, aggressive target of uh, achieving 1.5 gigawatt by 2025 and 2 gigawatt by 2030. And just to give an example of how aggressive it is today, we are, as of 2021, this was a little bit outdated. As of 2021, I think we are at 500 megawatt install, install capacity in Singapore. And uh, based on our target, we are expected to grow like three times in five years, right? The absolute number is not fantastic if you compare globally, but the rate at which it's expected to grow is, fan is fantastically high. And I think there are a lot of plans put in place to achieve that. And I'm very happy to share that, you know, T-Rex is, is part of the, you know, one part of the entire plan to try to achieve this growth that Singapore has set. So, So oh, um, we even though we are small, right? We have limited land, we have limited rules, and yet, how can we achieve those targets? You know, we really did it through innovation, right? We we have installed. Uh, the last time I made this presentation was half a year ago, and I am exactly presenting these two projects. And at that time, it was a forecast. You know, if, if you've seen enough projects that is being announced globally, you know, like half the project um, didn't turn out to be true, right? But in Singapore, when we say we do, we do it, right? So half a year ago, if this picture is a simulation, half a year later today, if you look at what is on the left, is a real five megawatt installation in the sea, right? Right. We, when when everyone was talking about floating on, on fresh water, you know, we are really talking about seawater. And this is a magnificent feat in my opinion, right? And Singapore is is famous for being innovation, right? Bringing innovation, right? And and we don't have land, but we have sea all around us. So this is the first of probably one of the very first few of its kind globally or at least regionally. And on the right, you see one of the largest uh, freshwater installation, you know, of uh, 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 solar panels in Singapore, right? So I, I'm, as a Singaporean, I'm very proud of the fact that, you know, we are, we are building. And these two are built by, you know, you know called, uh, uh, Singapore companies, right? One is from Sunsea and one is from Sankop. So I'm really proud of it. So that's why I, I brought this up. And I want to, so, if we bring the picture a little bit up to global, right? Beyond Singapore, um, for the past one to two years, you have been, you know, seeing a lot of news talking about ESG investment, and and you know, um, you can't really see real implementation of renewable energy sustainability projects until the financial institution starts looking into it, and this is what is happening, right? If you if you flip through the papers almost on a daily basis, you will see some news about ESG investment. So it has become a good to have to a must have. I've spoken to many fund managers, I've spoken to people in the investor relations for listed company, and you know, 
they are telling me that you know a lot of energy has been put into looking hard into the company's you know ESG you know related activities, right? So because um, both investors and consumers are looking at companies and making decisions based on how much you've done for ESG. So sustainability is a huge topic, and and I am super glad that you know we are part of it, right? And and we're working hard to to make sure that that um, we we are doing our part to to make sure that you know we're supporting all the sustainability efforts of of companies, you know, both Singapore and abroad, to to uh, to meet their goals. So zooming down to renewable energy as part of sustainability is. As you can see, right, there are a lot of global, big-time tech companies and the like who are committed to using renewable energy. There's this group of company called the RB100 company, in the like of Apple, Google, Facebook, you know, Unilever, IKEA, uh, who are uh, committed, right? Not only committing themselves, but committing their entire supply chain to go green. You know, I just I just heard a news from a partner in Taiwan, right? That Decathlon has just announced to all the suppliers that by twenty twenty four, if you do not have twenty, if you do not have forty percent of your energy consumption in renewable, then you you are running into very big risk of being taken away as a supplier. And this is not new. You know, this is this is this is happening. You know, since a couple of years back. That uh, big brands are started off having a request to their suppliers to go green, but it has now turned into a demand and turned into a requirement for you even to qualify as a supplier for the big brands, you know, to 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 continue to use you as a supplier, right? So so it's impacting companies directly. So with that said, um. Uh, let me jump into what we do and how we are supporting the entire ESG, you know, effort in Singapore and globally. You know, um, we go go if we go back in time, you know, you uh, traditionally it's the government that is implementing strategies to encourage people to go green, right? They start off with implementing in Europe, right? The the ETS, you know, um, to to enforce that um, companies have to have to abide by emissions target, right? And uh, governments start giving fit in tariffs to renewable energy power plants to encourage them to build when the price when the cost of building renewable power is high. But of course, uh, having to uh, having the government to to come up with money from their coffers, right? To encourage growth is not a sustainable methodology. And as a result, as time passed, you know, back in 2014, you know, this group of company come together called the R and formed the group called the RE100. We have 288 company based on this slide, but it's, it's already outdated. You know, every time I, I, I make a presentation, it's updated, it's outdated. It's already more than 300 companies globally that is already in RE100. RE100 means the companies have committed to use 100% renewable energy by 2050. Right, so this you can see that um, uh, it has the the responsibility has moved down the value chain from the country level down to the corporate level. So now the corporate level are driving the demand for renewable power. But what is the ultimate goal? The ultimate goal is, you know, instead of depending on a few countries, you know, we move the effort. To split the effort to a few hundred corporates, but uh, I think it's still yes. Uh, could you please uh, wrap it up in one minute? Uh, we have a few limited time, so oh, okay. our talk should be around six to seven minutes. So I'm oh, very sorry thought, to cut you off. Yeah, I thought I have sixty minutes. All right, okay, all right. I will. I will I'm I very will. sorry to cut you off, but okay, um, no problem. Have, okay, thank you. All right, me. so. So what T-Rex is trying to do is to enable every single individual to be able to contribute towards the demand of renewable energy. But for every individual to buy renewable energy, 
they need to have an easy way to do it. And that's what we do, right? I will skip this part. What we have done is we have created a, a platform to allow individuals or small entities to be able to contribute their effort in going green and driving the demand by allowing people to start buying renewable energy. So this is an example of what our platform does. You know, you can jump into our platform and start buying renewable energy certificates to do their part, to do your part for the environment. So uh, we, we I, maybe I should just skip this because we don't have the time. And these are a list of our customers, you know, who have purchased uh, uh, renewable energy from us through our platform. And um, five out of six, uh, Jen Taylor's in Singapore are already our clients, right? And and beyond Singapore, you know, we are we are into uh, seven countries in Southeast Asia, and we are partnered. We are partners with uh, one of the biggest uh, uh, platform operators called Envision, right? And uh, we're signing up a few more, you know, uh, soon. All right. So, um, I mean, just a last word. You know, we are operating our entire transaction on the blockchain and i believe for energy to move uh, uh towards the energy transition renewable and um this uh distributed generation is key and blockchain will be the core technology behind that will be enabling peer-to-peer -peer trading event eventually so uh t-rex is starting now and and towards the next couple of years i think I think the trend is moving towards peer-to-peer uh, -peer trading, of which you know we are we are well positioned to to uh, meet the requirement at that point in time when the electricity market structure matures. Okay, that's all I have. Thank you very much. Um, uh, if you have any questions, you can contact me here in my email address and my contact number. I'm based in Singapore. I'm happy to meet up with anyone who is interested to look into. Uh, renewable energy transaction, particularly RECs or renewable energy certificates. You know, I, I think uh, in Japan, um, there are many startups as well who are moving into energy retailing. I heard about someone doing energy retailing, electricity retailing in, in Japan. So I, I, I'm looking for opportunities for uh, working with corporates in Japan who has interest to, to um, look for renewable energy supply outside Japan and uh, also for my clients uh, in, in outside uh, Japan in Southeast Asia and Asia to, to support the, the counterparts in uh, Japan, right? So that's all I have. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much for your talk, uh, Jane Wei Tang. And uh, we also have um, a panel discussion after the talk. So definitely you can expand upon your ideas and your the details at that time. So okay. yes, really appreciate your um, presentation on T-Rex. So no we will move on to our second speaker who is Emir Nurov and he is the co-founder and CEO of Racing. And it's a startup building an AI driven energy cloud since late 2017. So I will give the floor to Emir for his talk right now. Sure. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks a lot for having me uh, in this event. It's my first time. So I'll try my best uh, to share as much as possible and to you know, learn from each of you. So just give me a minute. I'm going to share my screen and share a bit more about what we do at Resync. Yeah. Uh, can you see it? Yes, looks perfect. All good. Yeah, a bit of background about myself. Uh, I'm based in Singapore, originally from Turkmenistan. Uh, I don't know if you guys ever met anyone from Turkmenistan before. Um, uh, came to Singapore when I was 19. Um, did my university here, have a bachelor's degree in electronics. Um, together with uh, Jen V. Kang. Uh, I mean, we used to work at REC Solar before. Uh, it's a Norwegian solar manufacturing company. Um, so, uh, yeah, I did uh, research and development as a tech team uh, for four years and then afterwards I joined the London Acceleration Program called um, EF Entrepreneur First. And at EF, um, uh, met my co founder, Jayantika. 
she did her PhD at that point of time. She completed her PhD at that point of time, specifically focusing on developing control algorithms for energy and power systems. And together we started this company called Wising, uh, where we provide intelligent energy management solutions for the enterprises, mainly focusing on uh, smart buildings, renewable asset management and IoT devices. So a bit of background why we started all of this and where the motivation came from. Uh, as you know, uh, the whole energy infrastructure is going through transformation. And this transformation is mainly driven by a few factors, of course, drastically dropping price of renewables like solar, wind energy, uh, digitalization of the whole ecosystem with internet access almost everywhere, with smart meters, with IoT devices, uh, adoption of energy storage systems. We hear a lot about um, um, batteries, electric vehicles, and you know, popping up every day in our daily lives. And of course, adoption of AI and machine learning models for the automation purposes. Um, so four of these pillars driving traditional grid towards what we call smart grid or smart city solutions. And at the heart of this transformation lays the data. So whichever company has access to their data and can leverage on their data uh, can provide up to 30% of uh, energy savings and ensure sustainable operations of their premises. And that's what we do at Resync, and that's what we ensure to our end customers. We provide cutting edge technology, which is enhanced by in-house developed AI and machine learning models. Uh, we make sure that we have fully reliable infrastructure in terms of data aggregation, processing, storing, and feeding it to customers. Uh, we made it affordable, so it can be used by SMEs, small, medium enterprises, but at the same time, large MNCs. We are based in Singapore, but we serve customers across different markets because we are fully cloud-based and uh, we are quite agnostic to different markets. And that makes that very scalable in terms of we can deploy at one customer side and we can scale it to 100 sites within a matter of a few hours. Uh, we can customize our solution depending on the customer needs um, and ensure that you know, customer satisfaction is almost there. A bit of overview of how our solution works and who we do we serve. Uh, we have uh, individual stakeholders uh, who we provide our solution uh, specifically for their needs, be it an IoT asset owner, be it a solar power plant operator, or be it a building operators. Um, so we deploy our solution on their side. We aggregate real-time performance data of the distributed energy assets. We process that data on the edge, take real-time control actions if required to ensure sustainable operation and efficient operation of the premises. And at the same time, all that data is sent to the cloud. And on the cloud, we run it through different type of machine learning models in order to analyze uh, what's happening at the site and then optimize the performance on the longer run of the, uh, of the site. We do a lot of predictive maintenance, as component level details, and et cetera. And at the same time, all the data is sent to the cloud, is sent uh, to the customer throughout our user interface, uh, which we call Resync Portal. And the customer can have full overview and analytics in terms of what's happening at their site. Um, and on a larger picture, we work on some of the bigger projects, which are, we would like to call smart city or smart campus projects, where we basically ma ma uh, manage multiple uh, buildings with distributed energy assets. Uh, one of the examples is in Thailand. We work with BCPG, it's a Chiang Mai University, um, consolidation of around 200 plus buildings with around 160 buildings having solar on their rooftops. We have multiple containerized energy storage systems distributed across the uh, campus. So we synchronize those buildings. And as earlier mentioned, uh, we do B2B energy trading by utilizing the blockchain technology. So we're partnering up with, uh, we don't do blockchain ourselves. We, we are not experts in that, um, but we partner up with one company called uh, Power Ledger. Probably, I don't know if you guys heard about them based in Australia. Uh, they basically ensure all entire backend in terms of blockchain, uh, blockchain ledger for the uh, energy trading. But yeah, it's quite interesting project, smart campus in Thailand, um, quite exciting as well. So that's where we do our power plant operations, where we basically manage multiple buildings, multiple distributed assets and try to synchronize them between each other. Yeah, our main product is our analytics platform, uh, which basically can be integrated with any uh, tier one hardware manufacturer. We work with Huawei, Schneider, the ABB, SMA, you name it basically. But at the same time, uh, we have um, some of the kind of hardware components that if end customer requires, we can provide it to them. We partner up with hardware manufacturers. So uh, we integrated these hardware uh, components into our platform. So if you need real-time controller or gateway, which can manage entire building, uh, we have Resync Omega, which can manage uh, up to 60 devices in the parallel. And if you're planning to convert your house into the smart home solution, we have Resync Gamma, which is basically 
our uh, smart power flex solution, which can be integrated within any house uh, and can give you the real time performance of individual flux. We started our focus uh, and journey with like you know uh, renewable asset management solutions. Uh, we worked with OM companies, EPC companies, and etc. But then we expanded to smart building solutions, where in fact we received a grant from Energy Market Authority of Singapore in order to commercialize our solution from Singapore to world to the world. Um, and then we started focus on our telecommunication businesses, where we help companies, telco companies, to manage their distributed uh, telco towers. Uh, we did some pilot run with Nissan in Norway. I don't know if you guys know, but Norway is the biggest adopter of electric vehicles. Um, and we did some uh, analytics and you know testing in terms of how our solution uh, works in, in that environment where there's a lot of EVs and you know the proper scheduling, proper fleet maintenance is required. It was quite uh, quite interesting and quite successful. Um, we also have some micro grids that we manage in the region, uh, mostly off-grid and hybrid systems. Some uniqueness in our solution. So I think all of us, we have one thing in common is at the end of the month, we all get electricity bills. Uh, and in that electricity bill, we usually see a kilowatt hours uh, number, which is correlated with some electricity pricing. And then we get charged a certain amount. And only few people among all of us even um, can really uh, understand what's going on within that electricity bill and you know uh, how to make sense out of it. Um, so what we do, we help end users to understand not just how much energy they consume, but which type of appliance ensure that uh, spike in energy or where those energy savings came from. And the beauty of this solution that we don't need to install any hardware. So it's purely non-intrusive load mod, uh, disaggregation. So we call it NILM, non-intrusive load disaggregation model, uh, where we basically just get the data from your central energy meter and we can disaggregate it into the different appliances, be it's an AC, fridge, uh, microwave, and et cetera. So we currently do that um, deployment with like local authorities and you know Housing Development Board of Singapore, uh, National Environmental Agency of Singapore, and we work with some of the private companies like Capital Sample, et cetera. Uh, for buildings, we help them to disaggregate in a larger loads, be it an HVAC system, uh, data centers within the building or data servers, and then the heating elements. But also we create um, full uh, component level details of the building in terms of energy consumption, IoT devices, sensors, and et cetera. So it's quite, uh, quite a comprehensive solution that can integrate multiple distributed assets within it. Yeah. Few features, we provide predictive maintenance uh, for the customers. So basically we give heat map analysis of individual asset performances. Uh, we have fully facility management tool where you can integrate your organizational chart and then have ticketing system. Uh, we provide machine learning driven uh, forecasting beats the same day, 15 minute resolution or a few days ahead on hourly resolution. We dive up to the component level. We give like full palette of the data sets like voltage, current, harmonics and et cetera. Uh, and we ensure that customers get customized reports uh, for their ESG performances of their sites. I think I took too long, so I'll be very quick. Uh, sorry, it's, uh, we are a B2B company. Uh, we charge one time the integration costs and it's an annual subscription, depending on what is required by end customer and how big is the project. These are some of the customers that we're already working with uh, and that utilizing our solution. We are fully tech team, myself, my co-founder, both coming from the um, whoops. Uh, energy backgrounds, as I mentioned, the rest of the team is mainly focusing on the software development, data science, IoT device, integration, and full stack development. Yep, that's a quick overview of what we do at Twisting. And if you have any questions, I'll be happy to share more. Thank you. Thank you very much, Amy, for your talk. Definitely the advances of AI and machine learning is going to be exciting for the sustainable energy field in general. So I, I really want to discuss the disaggregation process, maybe in the panel discussion with you. So we'll if the audience has a question, please ask us in that time as well. So thank you very much. And we will move on to our third speaker now. Our third speaker for this evening is Jeremy Ong. And he is the managing director of B3 Energy. And he has more than 13 years of experience in solar with more than 12 gigawatt power of photovoltaics and over um, 1.5 gigawatt hour in energy storage solution experience. So Jeremy, 
the floor is yours. Thank you, Kabir. And thank you uh, for this opportunity to be speaking to you this evening. Uh, very privileged to be sharing um, something interesting, hopefully, for most of you. Uh, and to be the last speaker has uh, some privileges, I think. Um, okay, I'm not sure if y'all can see my entire screen. Right now, we can see the entire screen. So even the PowerPoint uh, okay. window is visible. Okay. Let's just... I think you entered the presentation mode, but we yeah. can still see the uh, window. Yes, can uh, okay. you see the presentation mode now? Uh, right now, it's your uh, presenter view. So yes. I think you need to change That's the fine. display setting. Yeah. yeah, I just go to display setting and change the viewing. The same thing on your laptop, on the top uh, left. Yeah. Display setting, scroll uh, at the top corner. Top left. Top left. Yeah. Up a bit up. <laughs> no. Uh, on the on the top bar, you can see display settings. In the middle, actually. Okay, Jeffrey. You know what? Just yeah, stop no. sharing. Just stop sharing. Yeah. And then uh, press share screen and choose second screen. Screen two. Screen one, you mean? Screen two. Two. Is it screen two? Yep. Yeah, then choose screen one now. You just stop sharing and, and choose screen one. I was thinking screen one. Okay. It's now perfect. Okay, we so, always have these troubles, so no problem. Please go ahead. So I will be sharing with you about PV module technology and the evolution of the last couple of years, past 20 years, and uh, where we're going towards in uh, the next 10. And uh, I think basically one of the things that I've seen in my relatively short uh, 10 years or more in, in the solar industry is that how technology has changed in the solar industry so fast uh, and it's still continuing to change. And so I think this is, a, it has given me a great uh, privilege to be able to share a little bit with you all. I think most people don't totally understand uh, solar, except they know that there are solar panels and the differences in each is also quite uh, unknown to most uh, people even in the solar industry. So I will try to take you through this really quickly. Uh, hopefully you can catch uh, uh, as I go along, okay? So this is a quick overview of what I'm gonna share. The, the current PV landscape, uh, technology landscape. Uh, then I will go a little bit into the R&D. Uh, it will not be too deep, trust me, I, I will make it Simple enough for everyone to understand, looking at cells and module efficiency, uh, then looking at how the markets have changed with the various uh, PV module technologies over the last 10 years, and then where the roadmaps are going towards 2030 in the next 10, okay? So what are solar modules? You know, this is the landscape. This is what you see, these three different sections, crystalline on the gray, uh, column on the left, thin film, the blue in the center, and then a mix of different 
types of solar technologies where on the green where you have um, various group three to five elements as well as emerging technologies where you see on the bottom right. So with crystalline technology, I think most of people are familiar that solar panels look kind of squarish. It's uh, rectangular with kind of square blocks stuck in there. Um, but that's as much as people kind of understand. Uh, and that's okay. I think you just need to understand that sunlight uh, is, is converted from the en DC energy to AC energy with the changing of the excitation of electrons on the light sensitive material, which is silicon, okay? And this is where majority of um, the market is at currently. So crystalline modules take about 95% of the market share. Thin film, another 4%, 5%, and a very small percentage is in the third category, category of multi-junction cells, okay? Just to highlight um, where the, the future of technology is really um, kind of looking at perovskites, okay? So just keep, keep remembering that word. Uh, you will see more of it later on, okay? So this, this slide obviously looks a bit uh, foreign to, to many of you. What is this saying is that this is a, a, a track of all the different module, all the different cell technologies by various different uh, manufacturers over the last 25, 30 years, or 40 years actually, since 1975. You see different trend lines um, aging upwards. Obviously you can't see all the names, but what you will see and notice is that the purple ones looking at multi-junction cells, crystalline, thin film, and emerging technologies. So you, you just have to understand that the efficiencies of all these technologies are increasing over the years, and it has exponentially increased over, uh, I wouldn't say exponentially, but significantly increased uh, over the last 10 to 20 years, okay? And one of the things that I wanted to show is that where new technology comes in um, and emerging PV technology coming in, you see the range of, of efficiencies from 12, 13%, all the way up to 29, 30%. So it's a fairly wide range. Uh, and these are all lab um, research efficiencies that have been certified by uh, independent uh, laboratories. So it is part of the process of making commercially viable um, solar modules and solar technologies that end users can use. Uh, and what we are seeing now currently uh, in 2021, uh, this is the bandwidth of these new technology efficiencies. Obviously the top of the range is, um, 29.5% efficiency from perovskites. Uh, it's a tandem junction module from Oxford PV. The second is, you know, 25.5. And this 5%, more or less, 4% uh, to 5%, is actually a very big jump if you, you really understand how, how technology or how efficiencies from modules have evolved over the years. It is every single percentage is actually a big, big milestone. So um, we are seeing that increase faster and faster. And this is where we are talking about module level. So cells, those two first two slides were on cells and cells are combined into an array to make a module. Uh, and this slide is to show how you see, even at today's level, um, you have three different category groups uh, of module, maximum module efficiencies from various um, module suppliers. You see things at the bottom where you have eight to 12% efficiencies, and these are kind of the, the emerging, uh, emerging technologies, some of them, okay? 
The second category in the middle, you see 17, 18% to 25%. And that's where you have more of the mainstream uh, technologies being able to reach those levels and uh, commercially viable. You have obviously some who are above 30%, uh, as you can see right on top. These are module level techno uh, efficiencies, but a lot of them are still really not um, commercially viable. They, they are a very, very small niche and they are in either very specialized uh, fields where you, you, the normal person won't buy it, usually for satellites uh, um, in, in, in such cases. So not, not especially uh, common to see it in a, um, solar roofs uh, or in commercial roofs or residential roofs. So the, the background is that majority of the, the efficiencies still lie in the, the, the high teens to, to the mid 25s, mid 20s. And I would say 21, 22 at the, at the current level, okay? The next slide I, I, I'm sharing with you is really how different module technologies, whether it's multi, mono, uh, and the like, are uh, moving very quickly. So this chart shows you the green, the green um, technology, which is multi, uh, multi modules, which has been uh, actually around from the beginning, and it take up the, the majority of the market share uh, of more than seventy percent. Uh, 2013, and I think it was closer to 90% in, in 2010. Now you see this huge trend moving towards the gray area, and the gray area is actually mono, mono technology and mono perp specifically. And the reason for that was just one key player, which is Longji. They basically started to have a slightly different strategy in, in actually uh, competing, and they said, Mono is going to be the, the market because of the potential of high efficiencies. And they were very focused on that and surprising. Well, it is surprising, but you know, now that they are the leader in that field, um, not just in the, the technology, but they are number one. I think currently last year, they were the, the largest module manufacturer at close to 25 gigawatts of, of module supply. So this, this C show you a trend, how fast within five years, you know, you can move the one company specifically, can move the whole entire uh, market trend and everybody else started to follow using Monopoly. okay? So where are we going? Now that we are in 2021, uh, actually what we are seeing, even at this moment is, is in a trend where even mono is starting to decline to some extent, beginnings, because we are seeing new technology showing a lot of promise um, because of the efficiencies that they are coming up with uh, much higher. In the last six months, I would say, two, two companies stand out of beating each other in terms of cell and uh, cell efficiencies, Jinko and, and Longji. So they are nearly every other week or month you see news that they have now reached a new world record. And I think this is the beginnings of how um, aggressive the, the speed of new technology is being um, facilitated. Um, you see the move from P-type to M-type. You see the move also from uh, Topcon, HJT, and more likely to, to have a tandem uh, junction sort of cells in the future with perovskites. Um, so this is where I think things will be really moving uh, quite quickly too. This is a quick overview to show how the different module players are also betting, well, not betting specifically on one. The green, uh, the green colored um, highlighted module manufacturers show you that some of them actually not just betting on one different technology, but both or even more than, more than one. So it is interesting to see that um, nobody is just going to live on one bet alone. So they're, they're, they're trying to diversify as far as possible and also to, 
to make sure that they are not left out uh, in, in the, the, the tough competition in, uh, in solar module manufacturing. So just to wrap up here, I think um, where we see the, the new move is that Mono is going to be phased out. You have also the end of multi uh, modules. We have uh, HJT and Topcon are the two, I think, most promising uh, in the near term, the near future. Topcon being easier to transition because many of the module manufacturers are still using uh, that technology and to change would be uh, just an incremental increase in their production line. But I think HJT has long-term high efficiencies and I think it's simpler to actually manufacture with uh, in a fewer number of steps in the process. Uh, and I think in the next five years, strong impetus to see tandem and perovskites uh, combining together. Uh, so there's been a, I think there'll be a lot of new interesting things to see uh, as well as uh, I think the, the number of new players coming in, uh, not just the, the current top 10, the tier one module manufacturers, but some other big uh, Chinese manufacturers who, who have just come up from nowhere because they are state owned. So we will, the solar industry is always very uh, interesting to see who's still around in the next couple of years. So, so that's my, my end of sharing. I know it's very quick. I'm not sure if all of you caught anything, but I'm happy to answer more questions after this during the, the panel discussion. So thank you. Thank you very much, Jeremy, for your talk. And it's really interesting to see that a company can actually shift the trend in a global business like this. So definitely looking forward to discussing with you more. Sure. So that is the end of our um, speaker's talks for this evening.